Okay, so we're recording. So Jesse can't hear. Um, so make sure. Okay, so I'm gonna have to do double duty here. Usually I have a speaker and then I can kind of do logistics while the speaker is speaking. So we'll just bear with me with that, please. Uh, my name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I'm director of the Arnott Teaching and Research Forest. And um, this is, so I, I run the monthly webinar series through Forest Connect. And this is, I think, going to be a fun webinar. It's uh, one that kind of came to me at the last minute. I was um, uh, sifting around trying to find a presenter. And I had a couple kind of on tap, and then I thought well, this came to mind. And it's about are you growing your best timber? And you'll, uh, when you registered, you uh, should have had the opportunity to download a an article that I wrote that's going to show up in the next issue of the New York Forest Owner Magazine. And it's about it's a titled essentially the same uh, presentation: Are you growing your best timber? So this is about, we're going to cover just very basically some of the basics of growing timber. It's not going to be heavy duty on that. There are a couple of, of other resources that are available that I'll direct you to that have, that are you know, webinars, full length webinars that go into this. So we're just going to kind of hit the core principles. And then I want to then segue from that into the Northeast Timber Growing Contest, uh, which is uh, a, a very cool activity that's uh, coordinated through the New York Forest Owners Association and Forest Connect. So you'll see more about that. What I, before I get actually into the presentation, I want to call your attention to if you go to the upper left hand corner and you click on, let me make sure I have this set up correctly. You click on the file menu. Click on the file menu and then click on either save or save as. If you save or save as the document, what you will do is you will save a PDF, do it the PDF option, not the UCF, do the PDF option of this presentation. And then you'll have everything right there and you can look at it in the future. Uh, there's not a lot of details I don't think that you'll be interested in, um, but some of them may be of use. So anyway. Uh, why don't you go ahead and do that, and we'll go ahead and get started. So what we're going to cover is four basic parts to this. We're going to talk about why grow good timber, how to grow good timber, and this is these are just core principles. It's not in-depth. And then we're going to talk about two different aspects of the Northeast Timber Growing Contest. We'll talk about the rules and the process. Okay, so hang on just a second. All right, there we are. So let's jump right in. So, what is, so why do you want to do this? Why do you want to grow uh, good timber? And what can you expect if you're actively growing good timber or being part of that management process? Well, first of all, there should be an increase in revenue. Um, either you're going to increase the number of trees or you're going to increase the value of individual trees. Uh, if you're actively involved and you're either doing it yourself or you're probably more likely dealing with a forester, you're going to have an increased knowledge of both the ecology of the forest and the management of that forest. I'll also uh, make the argument just here, I'm not going to really develop it, I mean, we can we can debate it if you want, but I'll argue that if you're being a good timber manager, you're producing, if not good, at least great wildlife habitat. And I say that because you're going to be uh, opening up the forest canopy, and the opening of that canopy is going to increase sunlight to the forest floor. You're going to be creating brush piles or at least downwood debris, and all of this is going to lend itself to improved wildlife habitat. Um, to the extent that you find saw timber trees, like you see in the picture, aesthetically pleasing, then good timber management results in improved aesthetics. And then finally, because uh, good timber management means your trees are growing well, 
and you've been thinning to reduce the incidence of disease and defect and insect infestation, you're going to have healthier trees and therefore healthier forests. And one of the kind of spin-offs just to illustrate one part of the, the benefits is the increase in volume. And this is a just a simple example. Uh, this is from some data in the 1970s by the US Forest Service where they were looking at um, oak production, oak saw timber production of uh, volume growth on uh, thinned and unthinned sites. And we, that says here site index of 75. We'll talk about site index more later in this presentation, but essentially it's a, it's a measure of how tall the tree would be, assuming the tree would be at a certain age. So site index 75 means that oak trees would be 75 feet tall at a base age typically of 50. And it's a way to gauge the quality of the site. Uh, tree height is proportional to or directly related to the quality of the site, the growing conditions. So if you have a site index 60, it's going to be a poorer quality site than a site index 75. And this would be uh, determined for each species. So what you can see, the red line illustrates thinned uh, research plots, and the blue line are unthinned research plots. And you can see that two points here, one, with thinning, there's a 25, in this particular case, there is a 25% increase in the cumulative board foot volume. So that's 25% more volume, saleable volume. And also you'll notice that that growth continues to go up at a, at a fairly steady rate. The unthinned stand looks like the data is starting to uh, stabilize. The growth, I'm sorry, the growth is starting to, to flatten out and the, accumula the accumulation of volume may be diminishing. So that's a benefit that we can expect with timber management is faster growing trees. And what we'll be ultimately doing, of course, is, is concentrating the growth on our best trees. Um, it's not, of course, without some, um, you know, not everything happens. Um, what, you, what you can't expect or what isn't going to be possible from a sustainable timber management strategy is um, that you're going to be able to use a laissez-faire attitude. And this is laissez-faire in the more general use of the definition, which is kind of a, of a hands-off um, approach to thinking about the process. And that relates then, of course, to the way that you manage the forest. You can't be passive. You can't just say, I have some trees, I have some woods, and at some point I'm going to go in and cut them. And there may be timber out there, but it's not going to be as good a timber. And it's uh, the, the volume and the value will be um, what it would be if you were actively managing it in a sustainable fashion. You also will not obtain annual big revenue checks, right? T trees are a, a long-term investment. You see the, the ends of these uh, saw logs here. And if you could zoom in and count the rings on those trees, you would see that they're you know, 75 or 85 or 115 years old, uh, none of us are going to give live. And, and that's, you know, from the same area. So you're going to be, there may be some areas of your property, depending upon the acreage that you have available, where you will have um, multiple harvests during your lifetime, but it's you're not going to have multiple big harvests every year unless you have thousands and thousands of acres. Um, and then also, we're, we'll talk about stands here in a minute, but not every owner is going to financially benefit from every stand. And that's just another way of saying that third point, if you have an area and you have a, ultimately do a complete removal of the saw timber, then uh, that stand will not produce another saw timber harvest in the Northeast, at least, for many, many decades. So there may be uh, you know, if you are the current owner and you have your property delineated into a dozen different stands, perhaps you will get financial benefit from two or three of those stands. The next owner will get benefit from two or three of those stands and so forth. You know, don't get bogged down in, this, in the specific details, but rather just recognize it's a, it's a shifting target. Okay, and I see that there's some commentary going on in the side. Dean and Norman, thank you. So I'll try to keep track if there are questions, um, but also others should feel free to respond to questions as they come up. So now I want to look at you know, the kind of the core principles of, of what you want to do to get started with timber management. Um, there's there's a couple different ways I was thinking to approach thinking to approach this, and I. 
I think the best way is to start with, so I've got, I have a couple of steps here. And this first step, as you can see, is uh, that I think you should, what's called tight map your stands. And this is typically what a forester would do. A forester would do this task for you. Um, and, and a stand to define it is a management unit. This is a picture from that I stole from uh, Brett Chedzoy, who's a friend and colleague with uh, Cooperative Extension, Cornell Cooperative Extension. This is his farm and woodlot. And a stand is basically, as I said, as a management unit, and it's defined as an area of trees of forest cover that are relatively homogenous within the stand and more homogeneous within than among stands. This homogeneous in terms of the species composition, the soil type, the disturbance history, the age structure of the forest trees, the size structure of the forest trees. It would be relatively analogous to a farm field. And, and the purpose of defining a stand or a farm field is that you would do certain things in one, I'll just say management unit, you can say farm field or forest stand, uh, you would do certain things in a forest stand that you would not do in an adjacent forest stand. And the farming example is the easiest way to illustrate this. If you have a hay field, there are certain things you do in a hay field over the course of the year. Uh, and that's adjacent to a pumpkin patch, and the things that you do in the pumpkin patch are not the same things that you do in the hay field. So similarly, in a forest stand, if you have a forest stand that's a young sugar maple stand, there are certain things you might do in that young sugar maple stand that's adjacent to a uh, to a pine plantation, and you're going to do different things there. So it helps you uh, focus and more efficiently utilize your management strategies. Uh, if you have a forest manager plan, uh, you probably will have a stand type map as part of that management plan. So the first thing, though, is to recognize your management units. The second thing is to prioritize stands for treatment. And the treatment that we're going to be moving towards is thinning to optimize the growth. Um, you'll want to consider at least four different attributes of a stand uh, so that you can prioritize them. One attribute will be the to, to uh, prioritize for the best soils. And the best soils are going to be reflected by the site index. We'll look at an example of that here in a few minutes. The picture that you see is a soil type map that's um, available through the web soil survey.nrcs.usda.gov. And the, uh, then from that web soil survey, you will be able to extract information about the characteristics of the soil and the growth potential of that soil. So you'll be able to essentially rate each of your stands, and the, and the stands would typically correspond to, just because of the way trees grow, would typically correspond to one soil type or a couple of very similar soil types. So that's one thing, is to rate it based on soils. A second uh, attribute to consider is to, is to look at the species that are present in the stand, and so you would need to rely on having this, an inventory of sorts. Uh, to see that the species that occur there in that stand are well matched and suited to the soils that, uh, that support that stand. So you might have an example where you have species like sugar maple that's growing on a, and I have this on, on our woodlot, I have some sugar maple and it's, and it's growing, but it's not really a good sugar maple site. And so the sugar maple doesn't look well and if and luckily, there are other species mixed in those stands, so I don't need to focus so much on the sugar maple. But if it was mostly sugar maple, I'd be worried because I could put a lot of effort into trying to grow those sugar maple faster, and the, the mismatch between the species and the soils will mean that I'll always struggle to get fast-growing sugar maple. So that wouldn't be, if you have a mismatch of species and soils, that would make it a lower ranking in the prioritization process. You'd want to also prioritize those stands that, that currently or previously had adequate stocking. Stocking is the number of trees per acre. If you have an adequate number of trees per acre, the trees will be competing for sunlight. They will tend to grow straighter, and they will um, develop a, a better form to the stem. And the stem is what's, of course, going to be very important for timber production. 
Um, and then finally, uh, prioritize those stands that have, uh, I'd say, a larger average stand diameter. That's because you're going to be making an investment, an economic investment, as well as a time investment, and we'll be managing stands to achieve some um, average stand diameter. Uh, we manage stands, we don't manage individual trees, and so when we get those stands to an average uh, stand diameter that's appropriate for our silvicultural prescription, then we'll be able to regenerate those, which is the time when we'll generate the most revenue. So if you're working with a stand that has a larger stand diameter, you're more quickly going to reach that um, diameter, that prescriptive diameter. So I want to be clear, I'm not talking about um, diameter limit cutting. And so I, I know there are lots of other people who are uh, here uh, attending, and if I'm if I'm missing anything, or you think there's other things to include as we're going through this, please don't hesitate to um, type in your comments. Okay, so you're going to prioritize the stands, um, and then. I'd say start in those stands that are fully or um, overstocked, but yet are productive. You don't want a fully or overstocked stand that's stagnated, that's just that's on a poor quality soil. So the, you want to pick a stand that's going to have the potential to respond to thinning. Um, also, the full stocking means you're going to have more trees to cut, and so potentially a greater uh, volume that will um, attract somebody to do the work for you. And I put two double dollar signs there. That doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get rich when you're doing this thinning, but it may be that you have enough volume that you can uh, attract somebody to do the work um, rather than you doing the work, which is when you do the work, it's an awful lot of work. Um, and what we're going to try to do, kind of the end goal of thinning, is that we're trying to improve the growth um, and the quality and the composition of species within a stand. And so uh, because trees are most limited by sunlight and the crown of the tree is the, is the sunlight receptor, uh, we want to focus growth on those trees that have the greatest capacity to respond to an increase in sunlight. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, favoring the growth of trees that have the upper crown class, and I'll show you a picture in just a minute, the diagram of upper versus lower crown class trees. We want to concentrate growth on trees that have a well-formed crown. Uh, so the tree in the picture that you see is a, I'd say it's a decent crown. I wouldn't say it's a great crown, and I say it's decent because it has pretty good development, but it's not great. Oop, I had a marker here. See how it's kind of elongated like this? So if it was a decent crown, then it would have um, you know, a more circular sort of crown. So it would be more filled out in those uh, in multiple dimensions. You're going to be uh, wanting to concentrate growth on 50 to 75 trees per acre. Um, and, and the average acre is going to have, that's where you're going to have most of the value. And then when you're picking those trees, these best trees that you're going to concentrate growth on, know that the majority of the value is in the lowest 16 foot log. So the, the 16 foot log that starts at the stump and then goes up uh, to 17 feet or so above ground. Uh, you might have a really nice upper stem, but if the, if the bottom 16 feet uh, doesn't look very good, then the whole tree is going to be, then your, then your, um, that tree is not a particularly good investment for providing sunlight to. So we're really trying, we're focusing here on getting sunlight to those best trees. So the best trees or the favorable trees or desired have some attributes that we want to focus on. Um, the, the trees that have the greatest capacity to respond to growth are those that occur in the upper crown class. And the upper crown class, it, in, that, in that growth, uh, based on some work that Dr. Nyland did, who's a silviculturalist at the State University of New York in Syracuse, found that the, those upper crown class trees you see here indicated with the blue arrows um, are trees that have three to eight times the ability to grow than lower crown class trees. So these, these smaller trees, like this one and this one, and you get the idea, and this one and this one, 
If you give them sunlight, they will grow faster, but their ability to respond to that increase in sunlight, to the reduction in competition, is one-third to one-eighth the capacity of the upper crown clusters. We want to look at trees that have healthy crowns, so if you're picking trees that have uh, dieback in the upper branches, so the upper branches are, are, are missing foliage, uh, those are crowns that, that there's, that's an indication that that tree has problems. There's probably a root problem or a soil, a soil damage problem. You would uh, maybe, maybe, I guess you could argue on this, on the third point here, the valuable species. If you're growing timber for yourself and you have, you have some, some particular interest in a given species, uh, then the value of that species may be less important, but probably you're going to be better served to focus on on the most valuable species that's best suited to the soil that occurs in a particular state. And then finally, we want to uh, favor those trees that have few defects. And I think the next picture has some examples of these defects, right? So here's a, a variety of these defects. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, we see this is a tree that has a split seam, uh, and this can happen for many number of reasons. Why it happens is really less important than the fact that it exists. And it's a all of these um, all of these defects create uh, two different conditions in the tree. One condition is that it's a structural weakness. It's 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 fundamentally impairs the the ability of the tree to survive the stresses that a tree must survive. So the tree might grow very well and have a very healthy crown, but it may have a, a structural condition that makes it more prone to damage. Uh, and that that um, that fork or this this um, seam is is an example of that. Um, the seam also indicates the second problem is that that's a reduction in the quality of the wood. Uh, epicornic branches that you see in the upper left-hand corner on this red oak tree are another example that if allowed to develop could, uh, and as the tree grows out, those would be defects in the outer stem. Here's a butt scar with a fruiting body on a sugar maple tree and a sugar bush, uh, but it illustrates, again, this is a tree that if you got down and looked at it, you would probably find the inside of that tree was hollow. Uh, the fungus that's growing on it suggests that there's going to be some, some wood decay issues and the tree's going to have uh, structural limitations. Here's a picture of a fork in a tree, and uh, oftentimes when you look at that tree, you will, uh, if you look closely right here, you will see that there is a seam and that the tree is poised to split. Um, you'll also see, uh, now I've scribbled all over, you can't see it very well, but you'll, you'll see a, let me change colors. Are these colors showing up? Are you seeing the colors on the screen? All right, good. I feel like John Matt and, and Football Sunday or something like that. So you'll often see a ridge of callus tissue that forms below that fork. And what that callus tissue does, it's, it's a swollen um, part of the tree, and it's the tree's effort to try to heal the fissure that's happening between those two forks. So the bigger that callus tissue is, the further it extends away from the side of the tree, the more pronounced the defect is in that tree. And then I have some other things, you know, here's stuff like this and stuff like this are, are defects that, you know, a knot in the tree means a structural problem that's also going to suggest that there's a hollowness or a, a degrading of the quality of the wood. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, this is uh, logging damage from some previous logging job, and that, that wound is going to extend, there's going to be discoloration that will extend some distance up the tree and it will reduce the value of that butt log. So, so avoid those things, of course. That's not where we want to be emphasizing our growth. So when we're thinning and we're talking about thinning, uh, thinning is an activity that happens during the, the middle growth phase of a forest. And its intended purpose is to increase, is, is to uh, improve the current trees. Right? So there are trees that are growing in the forest. Most of our forests are even aged. 
even if they're if our forests are uneven age, so they're going to be made up of cohorts of even age trees. And so we're going to be always working with essentially an age class, and we're trying to move that age class from immaturity to maturity. And we want the best trees as they gain maturity to be growing faster and, and increasing in value. The, fir, the, the focus of thinning is to improve the growth and the quality and the species composition of that particular age class. As we get towards the later end um, of the age of a, of a particular stand, then we'll be thinking about regeneration activities. And regeneration activities require um, greater finesse in managing the forest because there's more factors to contend with because you're trying to change the forest from a current forest to the next forest. So there's more barriers that we need to be attentive to. Uh, we'll be, we're focusing here mostly on the thinning activities. I'm not really getting into the regeneration activities. So if you want to s summarize this, uh, kind of the simplified prescription, and this is very simplified prescription for thinning for saw timber, uh, you'll want to retain trees that are in the upper canopy that have a healthy crown, that are well matched to the soils, that have good value for the species, good stem quality, and good projected longevity, right? So this is, there's that and is important because we, we want to try to attain, <clears throat> obtain all of those attributes of trees. The trees that we want to cut or kill are going to be those trees that compete with the retained trees, right? If, it, if, it's, if we have an ugly tree and it's out in the middle of nowhere and it's not next to a desirable tree, it's much of much less interest to us. Um, or we'll want to be focusing on removing the poor formed trees, uh, poor form of stem or crown, those in lower crown class, they're not well matched to the soil, or that we look at and we think it has a relatively short longevity. So there's a, uh, a webinar that I did uh, about a year ago, and the title of that you can see here is called Thinning Hardwood Forests for Health and Productivity. If you go to youtube.com slash forest connect and then you type in thinning hardwoods where you have where you see that little um, magnifying glass, the search window, uh, type in thinning hardwoods, you'll get a connection to this particular um, webinar. If you're quick or if you made a copy of this uh, presentation from the file menu, then you can go directly to that webinar from the link that's provided. Okay, so this is uh, simplified thinning for saw timber, simplified regeneration for saw timber. Um, what we want to use the seed trees is actually the same list that we had for the simplified prescription for thinning. We want to favor upper canopy trees, those with a healthy crown that are well matched to the soils, good value, good stem quality, and good projected longevity. What we want to pay attention to and be alert to and, and recognize as barriers are the potential impacts of deer, uh, the, the potential for interfering vegetation, whether it's native or non-native, doesn't matter. Uh, interfering vegetation can be problematic. And then avoid the temptation to high grade or diameter cut. So we'll want to um, you know, not look at your stand and say, OK, as trees reach 18 inches in diameter or as trees reach 16 inches in diameter, we'll cut them. Remember, we're dealing with average stand diameters. And I go in the article that I mentioned that's available, um, I go into a little bit more detail on that. Okay, so let's talk about thinning. Our goal again is to improve the quality uh, and the growth of the trees that we leave behind. Uh, one way to do this is uh, method one I'll refer to is called a residual stocking. And in this effort, we're working in stands that have a fairly uniform distribution of high quality stems. Uh, it's, it tends to be more quantitative approach. Uh, it's quantitative because the residual stocking is based on some numeric um, inventory data that your forester will collect. And the thinning is going to be spread uniformly across the stand because we have a uniform um, spatial arrangement of desirable stems. Now, the way this is going to look is, as you see here, uh, the quantitative measures that are going to be obtained are going to be basal area, which is uh, 
on an individual tree. It's the cross-sectional uh, surface area of the tree at four and a half feet in diameter, and then aggregate that for the stand. And then we have number of trees per acre. So those are the two primary measures. And we have our starting point here. We have a tree, we have a stand rather, that's at 100% stocking, and it has an average basal area of about 100 and an average number of trees per acre of about 325 or 330. So Mitch asks about thinning versus TSI. Um, no, they're not synonymous. Uh, TSI is timber stand improvement. Um, you would, if you thin correctly, then you would, um, you would improve the stand. Uh, but you can there there are um, uh, TSI strategies that would not be uh, uh, directly thinning the stand. Okay, so our starting point we have this blue dot. Uh, it's on the A line, which is the fully stocked line, and then we want we 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 know that or your forester will know that if your stand is actually stopped at the B line, we will optimize growth for timber production. So we would have a harvest, and in the process of that harvest, they would remove this many trees per acre. So you go from about 325 down to 200. So you're going to remove about 125 trees per acre, and you're going to be cutting down to about 65 square feet of basal area. Now your forester may decide that that's too much of an initial drop in basal area to lose essentially 40 plus percent of the basal area, so they may stagger that. However it happens, you'll you'll be moving at least towards this B line, which optimizes the growth. You'd let the stand grow through time. As it grows through time, you're not going to gain any more species, but as the or any more stems, as those stems get bigger, the basal area increases and it grows back to about 110 square feet of basal area. So we're back to the fully stocked line. So then you would thin it again, back to the B line, and then let it grow. And so this is an iterative process that would happen over many years. And you can imagine looking at this that it requires data, it requires inventory and time to allow these, uh, these trees to grow back. And it also assumes that you're leaving the best trees behind because the, the time it takes to go from uh, post-harvest to uh, being ready for the next harvest depends upon how fast those trees are growing. So if you leave the best and fastest growing trees behind, you'll achieve this um, restocking more quickly than if you leave the runts and losers behind. Okay, the second method is called crop tree release. This is um, a process that's uh, less technically involved than the residual stocking method, and it basically uh, involves the landowner identifying their objectives, which for our conversation today would be uh, timber management. You list the desirable qualities of your crop trees. The crop in this case is timber, and what we're doing, the crop, uh, unlike uh, traditional agriculture, the crop is something that you're harvesting in the near term. Here, the crop is something that we're growing uh, for the future. So we've talked about the desirable qualities of these crop trees. You would um, identify 50 to 70 of those crop trees per acre, and then you would release the crown of those trees from competition. So there, this crown has been released in uh, at least a couple of places, and it's going to be better able to respond to, uh, to growth. It's going to have better growth response because it has an increase in the sunlight. But essentially what happens is you're going to kill or cut those trees whose crowns compete with, that is, touch the crown of the crop tree. Uh, if you have trees that are below the main canopy, so this, this tree looks like it's a, probably a co-dominant, an upper crown class tree. If you had a lower crown class tree, it's not competing with this tree for sunlight, so it would not be essential to cut that tree. The, the downside of crop tree management, if you will, is that it doesn't control stand stocking. So if you're trying to optimize stocking at some particular level, crop tree management is not the way to do it because you're not taking those measurements and you're not using, you're not making decisions based on stocking. Uh, you would typically use crop tree management in stands where you have 
uh, fewer desirable crop trees per acre, and they're not um, uniformly distributed in space. You might have a good tree here and a good tree there, but then you'd have areas where there was a lot of, of undesirable trees, and so you want to concentrate your effort uh, thinning around these better trees. Okay, so how do we get rid of undesired trees? One way is we cut them. And if you're going to be cutting trees, uh, ideally you have enough so that you can bring in a logging crew. And, uh, okay, Jim says, I've heard that releasing one, two, three, and four sides is controversial. Comment. Um, I'll come back to that at the end, okay? I'm gonna, I want to make sure I get through uh, the, the, the rest of this presentation. And um, that, that's a good point, and I think I go into that in the thinning webinar, so we can follow up on that if we need to. So if you're cutting trees, uh, you want to do it using directional felling. The way you learn directional felling is through a process known, of, known as game of logging, where you, you're taught directional felling via game of logging. Game of logging involves developing a felling plan that includes these elements, and um, it allows you to more successfully pick the direction the tree is going to fall. There's no ropes involved. You don't use chains. What you use is wedges and applied physics. So uh, in this particular case, this is a, a white pine tree that's being cut. It was part of a research, uh, sugar bush thinning research project. There was only one way that this tree could fall without damaging uh, the sugar maple, which for this maple producer were the crop trees. And so by wedging the tree over, um, we were able to avoid damaging any damage to any of the sugar maple trees. So cutting these trees, this is a very simplified story of game of logging. And I'll just um, suggest that if you're in, if you haven't taken game of logging, you should take game of logging. And um, I'll type in a website. So the Cornell Force Connect .ning site has a calendar where we advertise game of logging trainings, and other people who host game of logging will advertise them. So game of logging is a great resource. You know, with any luck, you'll have a, a logger that'll do the work for you. The other option is to girdle these trees. Um, I'm not a very uh, big fan of girdling. It does have some positive attributes. Uh, it's quicker than felling the trees. Um, you can ring the tree and uh, kill it uh, within you know, just a few seconds. You can do it with a chainsaw. You can do it with an axe. You can do it with chemicals. Um, you, the, the, another advantage is that there's no immediate debris that you have to deal with. When you fell a tree, you have the crown of the tree that you're dealing with, and if you have any, you know, any if there's going to be any mobility through that stand, having a bunch of down tops uh, can be difficult. And the, perhaps the biggest advantage is that it minimizes damage from larger to smaller trees. So if you have great big trees in amongst larger trees, those big crown trees are invariably going to do some damage. If they have no value to them, it may be uh, more prudent to girdle them. So the downsides, though, as you can see here in this picture, the girdles have to connect. You can see this picture is a double girdle of a beech tree, and the person that did this girdling failed both times. Uh, what you'll also see in this on this lower girdle, see how deep that is? So it's this section right here is way deeper than it needs to. The girdle only needs to break through the surface of the bark and just get into the wood. Um, the tree will eventually fall. What you don't know is when the tree is going to fall or where it's going to fall. And what you create then is a, is a woodlot that's full of hazards. If you do a lot of this girdling and you then try and get a logger to come in and do work for you in the woods, they may be much less inclined to do it or would be put at higher risk. The trees die more slowly than if you cut them. That's kind of obvious, maybe. And uh, so it may take two or three years for the tree to fully die. Um, and then uh, it's also, I'll argue, not safe for subsequent felling. So you can grow to the trees and let them kind of die on the stump and say, I'll come back and cut them later. But the directional felling assumes that you're going to have uh, certain wood properties, and when the tree is dead and this wood starts to decay, uh, even in the first year, you are less certain about how that tree is going to respond. 
All right, so if you're going to have a, if you're going to cut the trees, it'll be either commercial or non-commercial. If it's commercial, uh, I strongly encourage you to work with a forester. Uh, the forester will know who the loggers are in your area, who has the equipment and the skill and the markets to be able to help you accomplish what you want to accomplish. Um, I'd recommend that you have a contract and then um, be sure to have a conversation with the forester, but more importantly, even with the logger, the guy that's going to be on the ground doing the work, you're making an investment in timber trees and you want to minimize damage. You may also have non-commercial um, cutting of trees, uh, and that non-commercial could be with or without utilization. If you're going to utilize it, you need to work with somebody, yourself or whoever, who has the skill and the equipment and the knowledge to know how to do this. Here's a picture. This is an um, old, old picture of Mike Grayson. Uh, he's got his lawn tractor. It's rigged up to move firewood. Mike had the, the skill. Uh, the equipment was uh, rudimentary, but it was adequate, and he had the knowledge to be able to, to, to extract low-value trees to grow better quality trees. Uh, kind of the point here is that, you know, just because it's your neighbor or your brother-in-law, they may not be the right person to help you thin your woods, and, and you may be better off in the long run not utilizing um, whatever it is you're cutting. The value per acre of these of these undesired trees is probably very low. Okay, so now those were the core principles that took a little longer than I thought, um, but let's just assume that now you are growing some good timber. What you may want to do, what I'd argue you should at least consider, is uh, is to is to look into this Northeast Timber Growing Contest. This was an effort that was an um, initiative that was sparked by Dean Fockless, who's a member of the New York Forest Owners Association in the Western Finger Lakes region. And uh, he and I started talking about this, and it seemed like a great way. We both uh, like to grow timber, and it was a, uh, we're both competitive, and uh, a lot of people are competitive, and, it's, and it seemed like a nice way to really highlight and recognize uh, individuals who are putting effort into growing timber. And so what I want to do now is just spend a few minutes talking about this timber growing contest. And you'll see the website is timbercontest.com. We made it simple, and you can download a copy of the contest rules. Um, what you see here is version 9, and I just looked on the website, and that had version 8. Uh, so I've I've asked my administrative assistant to up, make sure the current version 9 is up there. It's a very minor change that we'll talk about here. So why a competition? You know, it's not to pitch you against your neighbor at all, um, but rather to show, sharpen your focus and get you paying attention to your works. Um, you're going to have an increased awareness of what it takes to produce good timber because you're going to be actively involved with it. This will increase your knowledge. It will increase your skill. Uh, because you're thinking about your forest, you're also thinking into the future. It's going to enhance forest regeneration. It's going to connect owners with foresters because some aspects of this timber growing contest, you're going to need some technical skill. And so it's, it should provide a, an avenue to get foresters, more foresters talking with more landowners. We can use it as a way to educate the public about the value of forest productivity. And, and this is, I think, a great way to create a legacy. You know, we do hear a lot of, of talk about forest legacy. Well, the legacy is what you create on the ground, and so this is a legacy of good timber production. So the very simple version of the rules, uh, and, and in all of this, I defer you to the timbercontest.com and the rules that are posted there. Um, I'm going to be going through this relatively quickly, and I'm sure I'll miss some details, but all of the rules are online. We've tried to make them user-friendly. The simple version is you want to measure trees. We're going to standardize those measurements by soil quality. You're going to compare measurements of the same locations at two different points of time. We're going to calculate then the average annual growth if it's over one year or maybe you go in every two years or five years, and then you'll submit your entry. Now let's look at the details. So the details are, and this is the upper right-hand corner, is our, um, some contestants that are, are competing. Uh, they shared that picture of their hardwood stand. And there are two type, what we're calling type categories. So you, you would have 
either a hardwood or a conifer type, and you would have either uh, one of three production categories, so a basal area increment, a board foot volume increment, or a seedling height growth. So there's ultimately six different entries that you could make in any one year, and it would be, uh, for example, a hardwood basal area increment or a conifer seedling height growth. So you see those two types times three productions gives you six different combinations. So we're trying to accommodate all possible forest types. Uh, this is uh, focused on private individuals or schools. So if there's a school that that's, uh, has their own property, then they could certainly um, participate. The private individuals were excluding uh, state lands, um, industrial lands, uh, institutional lands. Uh, if there are youth groups, whether it's uh, K through 12 or 4-H clubs, they can create these plots on public lands. Uh, the, the purpose of that, of course, is to get these kids so they're exposed to thinking about how forests grow. Uh, this is the Northeast Timber Growing Contest, so we're opening it up to everybody in the Northeast. I saw there are some, some people from other parts of the country, and this is um, uh, so Indiana, we might stretch into um, probably Ralph out in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we don't want to be competing with your fast-growing conifer timbers out there. So and should foresters be, be involved? Absolutely, they can be and arguably very much should be serving as advisors and consultants. So what do you measure? There are three different production categories. If you're in the basal area, which can be measuring a square feet of basal area, you're going to be doing that on three different plots. If you're measuring board foot volume, you're going to be looking at total board foot production measured on 20 trees uh, from a particular stand. The, the basal area measurements are also taken within a particular stand. And then regeneration, again, at the stand level, you're going to be looking at average height growth from the tallest seedling on 20 different plots. And you'll annualize the data. So over whatever time period you're going to be participating, you'll be dividing by the number of seasons, of growing seasons. But you're sitting there thinking, this isn't fair. My woodlot has poor soil. I know my neighbor has better quality soils. I won't be at all competitive. But wait, there's hope. We're going to standardize uh, the growth measurements by soil potential. We talked earlier about site index. And what we require is that all contestants will need to provide us the soil data for the stand where their, where their plots are located. Uh, you'll, you can see in the picture, uh, this, is a, this is from the actual uh, downloadable contest rules. It's Appendix 1. This is uh, forest land productivity. This is available online through the Web Soil Survey. I gave that link earlier. This is a Howard soil, and it shows the site index for species that would commonly occur on this Howard soil. And then what we will do is add up, all the judges will add up all of these um, site index values, divide by the total, so we'll get an average site index. And then we'll say, for example, if your basal area change is 12%, we'll take 12 divided by that site index, and that will give you the score that you will submit, or that will be evaluated against other contestants. We'll do the same thing whether it's board foot volume or seedling height growth. So that score, so that the faster growing soils are going to have a larger denominator, the more productive soils should have a larger denominator, and it would then have a greater expectation for greater change in order to be competitive. So this is the, the way that we've decided is our best option to try to standardize across a variety of forest soils. So your sequence of events. You want to take, and this is the difference between version 9 and version 8. Um, version 8, we, we, uh, we had included essentially a, um, it was more confusing. This is simpler. Essentially, the growing season is defined as happening on July 15th. So you need to take your first measurements sometime before July 15th and your second measurement sometime after July 15th with data submitted by May 15th. 
Um, so in theory, you could take a measurement on July 14th and then another measurement on July 16th, look at the difference, and that would be your contest submission. That obviously is not going to make you very competitive. But for example, you might take your first measurement on June 3rd, your second measurement would be on April 27th of the following year. Uh, you would tabulate your data, put it in the mail by May 1st, so that it's received by May 15th. Okay, so what are you going to submit? All of the details are at timbercontest.com, but it's going to include an entry cover sheet that just gives your contact information, a category sheet that says which category you're in, you're going to provide your data, tree data, and you're going to provide soils data. There are, uh, Dean may remember, there are four or five um, judges that are going to be evaluating this data. We'll make sure that your entries are complete. We'll be, um, the, the forms have to be legible uh, so that we can understand them, and then we'll do the standardization based on the soils data that you provide. The scoring, uh, each category is going to have a winner, and it's going to be based on the highest standardized score. And um, then, we'll, then within each category, the first place winner gets second points, the second place winner gets eight points, and so forth, down to two points. This assumes that there are going to be people that have multiple entries. And then the person, the contestant that has the cumulative, total cumulative most points will be the grand prize winner for the year. So every year there's going to be this kind of ranking of winners. Um, we probably won't have uh, podiums like they have at the Winter Olympics. Um, but we will have uh, recognition through the Forest Owner Magazine and through other outlets. In addition to that, you may never actually win an annual contest, but as you compete through time, your scores will be accumulated. And when you hit a score, a total cumulative score for all of your plots and all of your submissions of 3.0, you'll be listed in the Hall of Fame of the Timber Contest, uh, duly noted as a timber beast. The prizes. Primarily your personal satisfaction, the fact that you are more informed and uh, able to grow your best quality trees faster. And if you do this, uh, you know, in the way that we think it's going to happen, it's probably going to result in stronger relationships with your family, with your friends, and between clients and professionals. So what are the measurements we're going to take? Here it is kind of in simplified form. You drive up to the plot. You're going to measure the trees. I'll strongly encourage you to, that if there's uh, snow on the ground and it's cold out, you'll want to wear a coat, even though these two contestants um, didn't go that far as to put on their coats. For the basal area increment, you're going to put in three plots in one stand. The plots are what are called a fixed radius plot, so it's a fixed size plot. The radius is 58.9 feet which is a quarter of an acre, you're going to put a nail and arguably a tag at one foot above the ground level. This is so you can identify the tree. Then you're going to put a three and a half foot stick on the nail so that you can measure uh, the diameter of the tree in the same location uh, at two different points in time. So this is a picture illustrating uh, using a, a measuring tape to stretch out 58.9 feet. There's a nail down here a three and a half foot stick, and then measuring diameter at the top of that stick. That allows for consistent measurements. These are some data from one of my growth plots. Uh, you can see I was measuring, in this case, I took my measurements last year on April 1st, or first measurement on April 12th, 2013. Um, I've not yet taken my second growth measurement. Uh, these are my tag numbers my species, and then the diameters of those trees. Then I'll be able to calculate, do the calculations for percent change in basal area. Board foot volume, uh, you're welcome to select any species that's desirable for commercial dimension lumber or veneer, even if it's a locally desirable species. Uh, so certainly if you have a species that's listed on your state stumpage price report, that makes sense. Uh, it may be a species like black locust that's uh, locally useful as a timber tree. You're going to select at least 20 trees in one stand that have a diameter, DBH, uh, diameter breast height greater than 12 inches, 
They should have two clear faces. You'll put in an aluminum tag and a nail uh, 12 inches above the ground. That allows you to measure uh, diameter changes in diameter growth, uh, two different points of time. Here you need to have a forester estimate the merchantable height of the tree. So you need to bring out a forester. They'll estimate the merchantable height between that height and the, and the measurement of diameter. You'll be able to, you and your forester will be able to calculate volume. And there's a website that's listed or a, a publication that's listed on the rules book that will talk you through uh, calculating volume if you're not familiar with that. Here's an example of that data sheet. So you'd have tree number, the species, particular species, and you'd have, you might have multiple species. So it might be sugar maple and red oak and black cherry and white ash, or it might all be white pine. Um, that doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. You can have a mixture of species. But they would be typically conifer or hardwood species. The seedling height growth, uh, these measurements are going to be taken in areas where you have previously regenerated the stand. Uh, so you've had some kind of uh, canopy disturbance, canopy removal. Uh, that's not a requirement, but the more sunlight you have, the faster those trees are going to be growing. We will exclude uh, plantations, so if you've planted the seedlings or even if you've used tree tubes or naturally established uh, seedlings, uh, it is possible to put up a perimeter fence to exclude deer. Um, you should not include stump sprouts uh, that directly come up. Some of these species will root sucker. Uh, we're not asking that you differentiate those, although uh, we may we may subset that category if we uh, the judges may subset that category if there's, uh, you know, you can imagine some black locust uh, compared to uh, some other hardwood species that doesn't grow from root suckers uh, that would perform very well. So just to try to keep things on an even playing field. It wouldn't be excluded, but just set up a separate category. Uh, within those uh, regeneration areas, you're going to put in 20 mill acre plots, so it's a thousandth of an acre, it's a 3.7 foot radius. We want you to pick plots that have good stocking, so an adequate number of seedlings, and then you're going to measure the annual height increment on the tallest seedling in each plot. So that annual height increment is shown here. So this is a sugar maple. And what you're looking for is this area of, uh, it's called the terminal bud scale scar right here. And then once you identify that on a hardwood or on a conifer, you measure this height. So this is this is a category that you could still enter this year and make a submission because this is essentially looking. This would be last year's growth, and you would measure this. And this this is the one category that does not require measurements at two points in time. And this is the data that we would use, or the data sheet that you would use to make a submission. Okay, there's a number of different um, uh, types of equipment that you would probably find handy. Uh, diameter tapes and distance tapes, aluminum tags and nails, tree marking paints, clipboards, uh, certainly other things. There's a number of different uh, supply companies that are available. I've listed some here, not implying uh, no implication for endorsement. Uh, if you want to see a variety of others, just do a Google search for forestry supplies. So with that, I'll encourage you to get out there and measure those trees. And on behalf of, uh, of Dean and the other people that have been involved in um, coordinating the Northeast Timber Growing Contest, uh, we look forward to having a strong participation. If you have more questions or, or need more information, you can look at the timbercontest.com website. Uh, I'd also encourage you to you can go to the forestconnect.ning site uh, and ask questions. Uh, publications are available on Forest Connect. You can email me, you can email Dean, um, and we can also now turn this over to questions. This is my, I think that's my last slide. Yep. So let's see what we have for questions. Now while we do that, I'm going to grab the, here's the link to the exit survey. So please complete that exit survey. Now let's see what we have. So Norman says, 
uh, ridiculously high real estate taxes are significant detriment to forest management. Um, no, haven't seen anything. Uh, efforts to reduce property taxes. So uh, hopefully somebody else here can remember there have been. So there's a group in New York. I can only speak for New York. There's a group in New York that's called the Council of Forest Resource Organization, CFRO. And they solicit, this involves uh, industry groups, uh, landowner associations, professional associations. And they participate, their primary activity during the year is called Forestry Awareness Day, where they meet in Albany and meet with legislatures to inform them of issues that are relevant to private, to, to forest land management in New York. One of the big issues, of course, is always, has always been taxes, and so there's been a lot of effort to try to um, bring awareness of the high property taxes uh, in New York. I, I agree with you that they are ridiculously high in New York. I can't say how high they are in other states, but I know that New York is quite high. Um, so that's uh, that's one effort. There have been, and I don't remember the exact uh, status of this, there has been efforts in New York to try to revamp or rewrite the forest property tax law. In New York, that's the 480-A New York State Forest Tax Law. It has, uh, it, it's, there's an analysis done by Dave Colligan, as I recall, of all forest tax law programs in the country and uh, that and whoever wrote it determined that the New York tax law was one of the most archaic and draconian of the forest tax law uh, programs um, in the country. So there's, I, I agree that there's opportunity for improvement. I think this is something that's going to be um, most, um, uh, is going to be best addressed through uh, efforts by people that actually pay the taxes. So the university role would be to document uh, what's it cost to actually produce timber and then and the, the potential value produced per acre and then comparing that to what it costs to grow timber per acre and looking at the disparity. So I, I don't I don't disagree with you and I I just can't um, I'm not able to to suggest any solutions off the top of my head. So John says, yep, yeah, so this is relative to that same tax as forest landowner says, the percentage of taxpayers are, are too low to be effective. Um, so suggesting there's different tax procedures, uh, calculation methods that are available. The other thing to do is even though forest owners are a small number, there are, uh, in New York, there are above one acre, there are almost 700,000 forest owners. And so if you look at that as the number of people, and, and all, they all come from families and they have friends. And so if you look at the, the total number of people involved, it's bigger than you might think. And then if you look at the impact of forestry as an economic driver, that's where you have your argument. Okay, Jim says, great question here. Isn't DBH usually measured at four and a half feet? Contest asks for a three and a half feet comment. Yes, John says it there. So you have a nail that's put in the ground at a, uh, a foot above ground, and then you place your three and a half foot stick on that so that you are measuring at four and a half feet. Um, the, the nuance of that, the, the picture that you see on the screen here is showing you can, you can see the stick here, uh, you can't see the nail that's in the, in, the, in the butt of this tree about a foot off the ground, and this stick is a three and a half foot stick. So this is a, an intern I had a few years ago, Cheryl Horton, was measuring DBH of this red oak at uh, four and a half feet above ground. The nuance is that the nail doesn't have to be exactly one foot above ground. You want it to be approximately one foot of, above ground. Uh, what's most critical is that you're taking the measurement at the same exact location at two different points in time. So uh, if, if your nail is 
12.3 inches or 11.1, it really doesn't matter. The important thing is that you're able to take the height measurement at a consistent location from one year to the next. Okay, so let me just scroll backwards. Uh, Jim earlier asked about uh, one, two, three, and four sides of release. And um, so, and that's with crop tree release. <clears throat> so I'll, uh, I'll answer that with, in two ways. One, I have the, the thinning uh, webinar that I gave the uh, location for that goes into much greater t detail about crop tree management. I had one slide that was about half of that presentation. Uh, but ultimately, with crop tree management, the more sides you open up, the faster the tree is going to grow. Okay, that's a fairly uh, predictable pattern. The danger with uh, or the concern that you need to be alert to if you're making a three or four sided release is uh, there are three considerations. One consideration is that uh, you're going to increase the amount of sunlight to the forest floor. The more you open up the stand, the, uh, the, the greater, uh, so if you, let's say you mark 50 to 75 crop trees per acre, if all of them have a four-sided release, that's an enormous amount of cutting. That's going to be an awful lot of sunlight that's going to come to the forest floor, and you will stimulate some kind of a vegetative response on the forest floor. So if you have uh, invasive plants, um, multiflora rose or bush honeysuckle, within a couple of years you're going to have a very dense understory of whatever uh, seeds or seedlings occur within the forest floor. So be alert to that. It may be something like raspberries, and I've done some, I have some crop tree management research plots where uh, we did a four sided release, and within three or four years, you almost couldn't get into that area because the raspberries were so aggressive, raspberries and blackberries. So that's one concern. A second concern is that depending upon which trees you release, and some trees tend to be uh, more prone to developing epicormic branches than others, uh, but you can, with a, with a more aggressive release, the trees, oak trees, for example, tend to produce more epicormic sprouts. And there are some of the foresters in here that have uh, field experience with this. I'd welcome um, reactions to kind of the crown class impact. So upper crown class trees tend to produce fewer epicormic sprouts than lower crown class trees. That doesn't mean that you would be free of epicormic sprouts. So if you're doing that, you should be alert to the presence of those epicormics and uh, plan to go back, uh, if possible, and, and bump those epicormics off with a pruning saw. The third consideration with uh, doing a very doing a, an aggressive uh, three or four sided release is that the, the, depending upon the um, mechanical stability of the trees, uh, the, those trees may have developed some dependency up on their neighbors. And the more you open up the stand, the greater motion you're going to have in those trees during wind events, and you have the potential for uh, wind throw of the crop trees you just made an investment in. So I would, these are, are, that's a very good question and it's a serious consideration. I'd, I'd encourage you to uh, discuss with your forester the options of, you know, to what extent you should aggressively thin your stand. And it may be that you do a four-sided release on 10 trees per acre and a two-sided release on 40 trees per acre, something like that. Okay, let's see what we have for questions. So, yep, Ralph says the uh, 4-H and FFA is another would be another good group to involve uh, students. Thank you, Dean. Dean was Dean is the, the energy behind this effort. So feel free to contact Dean. Okay, Charles says half mile of dirt road frontage. Not girdling or felling any trees along the wall, wall boundary. Bounding the road. So, um, so Charles, I would and others, I'd welcome to react to this. In terms of girdling, I would not consider girdling within one tree height 
of the road. So if your trees are 60 feet tall or 90 feet tall, stay back at least that far from doing any girdling. In terms of felling, I'd be less concerned about that as a liability. If you use directional felling, you can fell them away from the road. If there are trees that just because of physics have to fall in or near the road, you could post a lookout uh, depending upon you know, how heavily used that dirt road is. You could The trees could be felled and cleaned up before the next vehicle came by. So I would just be be alert to that. Liability is a concern, particularly with the girdled trees. Um, you're creating a hazard, and, and it's, uh, it's you that created the potential problem. So, all right. So let me post again the exit survey. I do hope you'll all take time to complete that. And uh, with that, uh, there are no additional questions. I'm going to go ahead and call this webinar closed. Thank you all very much. Go out and measure those trees.